um, my name is Rachel, and I'm going to be introducing my coworker, Anya, who's going to talk about how to get Spark jobs to run in scale and in practice. Um, it's about Spark tuning for enterprise system administrators. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so don't worry about um, missing something in this talk. Oh, this is a different uh, slide. We're, having... oh, yeah, we're not seeing up here. Oh, there we go. So to the... Ah, all right, just, to, just a little short here, but so you don't need to worry about missing anything um, in this presentation because we've provided our slides on SlideShare at slideshare.net slash Anya Biden. And then the cheat sheet, which Anya has developed through her extensive experience tuning Spark applications is available on GitHub, um, both for your reference during this talk and then for the rest of your time developing Spark applications as you need it. And then down here we have our contact information. Um, so then by way of introduction, Anya and I both work at Alpine Data, uh, which is a small analytics company in San Francisco that creates analytics tools that have a, a graphical development environment, which are installed in cluster for our enterprise uh, customers. So I write Spark applications, which are designed to handle a variety of different kinds of data. And then Anya has the lucky job of actually getting those applications to run for our customers' particular data storage solutions and their actual data. And so I'm going to hand the floor to Anya, who's going to talk a little bit about some of her lessons from that exercise. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Everybody can hear me? Good. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I may maybe assume or about the audience about you. Um, maybe you are enterprise system administrators. Maybe you're data scientists or developers. Everybody can benefit from these very practical tips that we've come across. Um, I'm also going to bet that you want your Spark application to be successful. I'm going to bet that maybe right out of the box, your application is running intermittently. Maybe sometimes it fails, sometimes it succeeds, and that can be kind of frustrating. Um, you'd like to get to be your Spark application to be running more reliably. I bet that applies to everybody in the room, and maybe even optimally. So this talk is going to focus most on getting you to that very reliable step, which I find is, um, comes, to, comes up rather often. So we're going to assume everybody's kind of at this, we're going to do some level setting and get everybody to that intermittent stage with your Spark application. Um, the first thing that I noticed um, the default settings with Spark are often not recommended. And that's kind of something that I had to wrap my brain around for a moment. Um, so for example, by default, your Spark executor memory is just one gig. You know, and that might work great on Rachel's local machine, but when I go and try to deploy that at the, on the pro customer's production cluster, that's not a good idea. Um, this is designed on purpose, though, so that your Spark application can run even on a small cluster. It's, it's designed that way on purpose, and it's, it's a good design. But Spark basically assumes that you're going to change this value, this particular parameter. So there's a lot of cases like this where the default setting is not recommended. So you know Spark is infinitely configurable, and there's so many parameters. Which ones are important, and how do I configure them? So that's how we came up with the Spark tuning cheat sheet. Um, it's basically a rubric. Um, I don't intend for you to read this slide at all, but the cheat sheet, you can look it up. It's, it's basically you know, a series of questions, and if, if yes, follow this path. If no, follow that path. And so I'm not going to talk about the whole cheat sheet today, but just a few um, subsets. The, the talk today will be clustered in, uh, into two main categories. First, consideration for a shared cluster. And if you're working in an enterprise, you probably have to use a shared cluster. You may not want to, but it's a reality. Um, and then the second consideration is I've got memory issues with my favorite Spark application. So those are the two categories we're going to talk about. Um, so first, it's considerations for a shared cluster. So you're probably familiar with the concept of pools if you've worked as a Hadoop administrator. Um, maybe, maybe not, so we'll just level set. Um, there's a pool of resources. And if you've got your own cluster, you can use all those resources for yourself. Right? Um, but when you want to share that cluster, you might have to divvy up that large pool into maybe some smaller pools so that you don't just have one big dog using all the resources, doing all the belly flops. Right? So you might have a pool for sales, a pool for marketing, a pool for engineering. And you've got to um, isolate those resources and make sure everybody can run their jobs. 
So how do you do that? Well, each pool has a designated amount of memory and virtual cores. So it's, once you understand it, it's fairly easy to set up. There are some um, specifics I want to go into, though. And don't worry, we'll walk through it one by one. Um, the fair scheduler is something you definitely want to use. Um, but the Spark fair scheduler is different than the Yarn fair scheduler. And I imagine maybe most people in the enterprise space are deploying Spark on a Yarn cluster mode. That's kind of what our customers are centering on at the moment. It might change in the you know, near future. But at the moment, they're using, they're using Yarn. Um, some things to note. So there's some things that are shared between the, the Spark fair scheduler and the Yarn fair scheduler. For example, the, um, the allocation for uh, virtual cores. So on the, on the Spark side, it's called your min share. And on the Yarn side, it's called your, um, your minimum resources for virtual cores. Um, definitely set this for your needs in your particular pool. Once, once Spark um, allocates resources according to the minimum that we set in the previous slide, the weight comes into play. So the higher your weight for your queue, the more important your job is, and so the, the higher priority you'll have. So definitely assign, assign weights to your queues. Um, but I want to point out, in the Spark um, scheduler, these parameters are missing. So definitely use these parameters. <laughs> so what, what you see here, um, you can specify the minimum memory that's allocated for a particular core. And you can define marketing, you're allowed this minimum memory. And sales, you're allowed this minimum memory. And let everybody know that so that you run into fewer out of memory errors. It, it's simple, but it really is helpful. Um, you can also specify the maximum resources. Again, very useful. Um, and this is all on a queue basis. But the other thing you can do is specify um, at an individual user level. So um, at the bottom there, you see the maximum number of running apps for a particular queue. Again, for that, for that pool, you can also specify that at the individual user level. So I can say, hey, Rachel, you can only run six applications at a time. You've got to share. So the next thing that the developer wants to know, well, what's the memory limitation for my Spark application? How do I figure that out? So we'll have two equations, and we'll walk through them very slowly. Don't, I know it's late in the day. I appreciate all your attention. Um, so the first equation, what we want to know is this right-hand parameter. My Spark application, what's the memory limit? So first I'm going to think about, okay, well, how much memory is available in my pool? And remember, we just set that in the previous slide. We set that in the, in the fair scheduler. So here I've got about eight gigs you know, for a small cluster. This is how much memory is available in my pool. And I'm going to just take that, multiply that by three quarters. Basically, I'm reserving 25% of my memory for overhead. It's just a, you know, a good place to estimate to start out with. And so now I've, I've calculated, OK, that's my memory limit for my Spark application. Fairly simple, right? So we're going to take that value and use it to determine some configuration settings. So when you are running your, you're submitting your Spark job, pay attention to these configuration settings. They're basically key value pairs that you can you can set for your job, or for your application. And so the second equation uses some of those, those keys that you'll use to configure your Spark conf. Um, so we saw, we know what our memory limit was, right? So we're going to just take that same value. That's my memory limit for my Spark application. And now I need to determine how much memory to allocate for my driver, how much memory to allocate for my executors, and how many executors I'm going to allow my job, right? So once you know the limitations, then it's easier for you to, to tune all these different knobs. So I'm just going to go through some of those limitations. So for example, on the driver, your driver must not be larger than a single node. Fairly simple. Um, same thing for your executor. Can't be larger than a single node. Well, how do you figure that out? You use this simple equation that um, you, can, you can find um, online on the slides later. But it's just really helpful to know these limitations so you, so you understand um, how to tune that executor memory parameter. And then um, your max executors. I assume everybody here is using dynamic allocation. If you're not, it's great. Try it out. It came out in Spark 1.3. Um, dynamic allocation allows me to change the number of executors um, through the course of the job. And all I have to do is specify the minimum and maximum number of executors. So here I'm calculating my maximum number of executors in the dynamic allocation paradigm. How do I know what's, what that value would be? Well, the limitation here is that my maximum executors cannot exceed my pool allocation for virtual cores. 
So we, we know what that value is already. So each of these limitations, we know they're readily accessible. So those were all settings that you can configure in your Spark Conf when you run your job. So those were some considerations for the shared cluster. Um, and next we'll talk about memory issues. You know Spark is a memory hog. You're going to run into out of memory issues. It's just a fact of life. But what do we do here? Um, the way I see the world, you can take this problem with two, two approaches. Um, on the left-hand side, I could reduce the amount of memory that's needed for my Spark application. Or on the right-hand side, I could gracefully handle my memory limitations. And that's how I kind of think about the world, this, the world of Spark memory tuning. Um, so we'll start on the left-hand side. And there's so many different options here. <laughs> there's no way I could go through all of them. Um, so there's some, um, there's some options listed on the cheat sheet, but we'll just talk about one scenario here, right? You know, you should definitely talk to your data scientists about, you know, reducing the memory that their data structures are going to take. Um, but something that's useful for, in, in many, many cases, um, check out in your, um, let's see if uh, the, the pointer doesn't show up here. Check out in your Spark web UI. If you go ahead and persist your RDD, you can click on storage, and you can see how much memory your RDD is actually taking in memory. How, what is the size in memory? So this is pretty handy. Um, this one thing to note, and then see what happens if you persist that RDD with serialization. So serialization is really handy. Um, there is some cost up front, and it does take, take some time to serialize your objects, but it's pretty handy when you come up to garbage collection. You know, garbage collection takes a lot of time when there's a lot of objects. Is this object old? Yes or no. Is this object old? Yes or no. But it's a lot faster when there's just one object in buffer that, um, that the garbage collector has to say, is this object old? Yes or no. So, so try serializing. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're not sure, is serializing useful in my case? In the Spark Web UI, you can show some additional metrics, and you can actually take a look at how much time um, you're spending on result serialization and how much time you're spending on deserialization. So that's pretty helpful in terms of as you iterate, is serialization important for my job at this time? The other thing that's recommended, use the cryo serializer. Um, it's, again, another one of those cases where the default is not recommended. The default serializer is the Java serializer. It works in the broadest amount of cases. But if you, if you can cryo serialize, definitely try it. So we talked about ways to reduce the memory needed for my application. Let's talk about ways to handle those, memory, those out of memory errors gracefully. And again, there's a lot of options here, so there's no way I could cover all of them. So we'll just talk about one scenario. And here we'll talk about maybe some problem and maybe a potential solution. So for my, my problem that has arisen, these are the symptoms. My Spark application is running for several hours. I'm super pumped. I want to see the result. And then I see the error message. Container is lost. Oh, no. And then I notice not just one container is failing, but the other ones are failing one by one. So after we cry a little bit, we got to figure this out. We notice that the first container to fail was the driver. And the driver turns out to be a single point of failure, right? Because the driver is in charge of, of handling all the executors. And all the executors have to communicate back to the driver. So in this case where you've got driver failure, um, you should definitely, as a system administrator, talk to your developer and say, are you using the collect statement? Are you collecting an unbound amount of data back to the driver? Don't do that. Um, but your, your developer might say, no, no, I'm just using a take. I'm using a count. I am collect, I'm, I'm bringing a known number of rows back to the driver. I would never do that. The next thing you might try is checkpointing. And checkpointing comes into the, the Spark streaming literature quite a bit. I haven't seen it very much in the batch literature, but it comes in handy for us in a lot of cases. So we'll tell, tell you about it. I'll talk to you about the function of checkpointing, how to use it for batch jobs, and um, the particular use cases where it's come up very helpful for us. So the function of checkpointing is to save the RDD to stable storage, HDFS or S3. How do you implement it? Well, first, you need to specify your checkpoint directory. It's one directory for your whole Spark context um, where all of your RDDs will be checkpointed. And then you just call RDD checkpoint. That's it. So 
So it's, it's pretty simple to implement. It comes in handy, um, especially in these use cases. If you've got a high traffic cluster or you've got some, a lot of network blips, which are more common than you might think, you know, you've got your Spark application you're running from Palo Alto and your cluster is located in Virginia, there are more network blips than you would like to think. Um, also, in case your, your administrator has enabled preemption, for some reason you might have, you know, the CEO wants to run their data and they need to stop everybody else's jobs so they can run their data, that's preemption. <laughs> um, in that case, you definitely want to use checkpointing. It saved us a lot of headaches. Or if your disk space is nearly full on many of your nodes, Try checkpointing. <laughs> um, in the cases where you've got this driver um, fault tolerance that you need to handle, it's definitely very useful. So hopefully at this point, all of you have gotten to the point where you are running reliable jobs. Um, not just, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Your cluster is um, set up with the shared cluster considerations. You've considered how to gracefully handle memory issues and all, how to reduce the memory that your application requires. Um, and for our customers who follow this kind of rubric, they report their Spark jobs are completing in an hour instead of two and a half hours. So there is performance improvement with the, just these tuning knobs, rather than just relying on the logic of the, of the algorithm. <clears throat> to really get to that optimal state, check out the cheat sheet, there's more tips. But also, check out, um, there's a new book coming out, highperformancespark.com, to really understand the internals of Spark um, and run your job most optimally. So I recommend some further, further reading. Um, this is available on the web, some resources that I used and um, would recommend. There's a lot of photos on this one. Um, this is probably the page you want to take a picture of if you've got more questions. So the, the presentation is there on the web on SlideShare and um, the cheat sheet is there as well. And I thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. And also, um, we've got a booth if you want to talk more about Spark tuning. There's two Spark tuning talks tomorrow, which I'm really excited about. So I hope to see you all there. So thank you so much. All right, have we got any questions? Don't be yeah. shy. I think the question is, um, have we tested up um, succinct Spark? Yeah. You know, I, I can't say that I have. That'd be an interesting thing to look into. Over there. So sometimes you see the executor's uh, you know, container lost and it's because of an executor and then you try to debug it and you see you either need to raise the executor memory or sometimes like the shuffle partitions. Like, do you have any tips for what number you should use for shuffle partitions before you even get you know, executor failures and try to debug? Sure, sure. That's a kind of a loaded question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the recommendation is I think two thirds, you, your number of shuffle partitions should be two thirds the number of total virtual cores on your cluster. Um, but I have, to, I have to look at that number to, be, to verify. Um, but you know, number of partitions, you've got to trade off, right? If you, if you have too many partitions, you might find that some of your partitions have, are, they're writing zero data, or they, they finish in like zero nanoseconds, right? So then you know you've got too many partitions. Um, but on the other side, if you've got too few partitions, um, that can be problematic too. Um, you really have to find some optimum, and it, it does take some iteration for that particular job. Over there. Also, so, sorry, you mentioned about the um, amount of memory on your JVM. You should look into modifying the, the Spark storage memory and this, um, this I'm sorry, the Spark, stori Spark memory storage and Spark memory storage fraction. And so um, it changes, the, Spark has this awesome um, new method that, um, Right now, there's, there's a single partition, uh, partition is the wrong word, there's a single region for, um, for memory um, um, that is used for both storage and compute. And so you can modify that, um, that level. And I think that would, that's probably very handy. Sorry. Hi, uh, I have a question. So this Spark tuning, can we do it uh, 
on per query basis, or is it for the entire application? And also, if your Spark application is shared by, uh, say, 50 or 100 users, how do you manage concurrency? Do you mean your Spark application is shared or your Spark cluster is shared? Uh, both. Oh, OK. Um, so the, what I've showed here is how to, how to manage many users with many different applications. Um, but if you want to specify parameters for a specific application, you know, I actually don't know how to do that outside of Alpine. But Alpine, um, I can, I can oh, maybe Rachel can speak to that. Yeah, so a lot of these, so one Spark application corresponds to one Spark configuration. Um, so a lot of these things that Anya talked about in Spark Conf have to happen at that application level. Um, however, there are some things like checkpointing and the number of partitions, which developers can set dynamically in their Spark jobs. So that answer is actually not consistent um, so there are some things that have to happen at that application level and some things that can happen more at the job level. Right. So, for example, if I develop an application and um, for me it works fine. And yeah. when I tell other users that, hey, go ahead and run your Spark code and uh, if they try to run and if there is um, a situation when they run out of memory because a couple of users are using simultaneously or so who is managing the configurations? Is it the developer? Is it the administrator? Uh, so, so it happens at a couple of different levels. So S Spark handles the sharing between jobs for the same Spark application. So Spark has, a, I think, a f its own fair scheduler that will handle managing those jobs. So that's one set of configurations that you can set uh, in the Spark comp, either by the developer, developer or the system admin. Okay. And then to speak as well on, on the Yarn side, the Yarn fair scheduler is configured only by the administrator on the cluster. So the, the developer wouldn't have access to that. But it's helpful if the developer knows those limitations so they know how to set up their individual Spark, their Spark application. Thanks. Sure. And um, I, I like to configure my, my Yarn settings either with my, if I'm using Cloudera, with Cloudera Manager or with Embari um, or on the command line. So that's how, as an administrator, I would do that. I think a motivating thing for this talk is that our experience with Spark has really been that it requires a relatively close communication between those two parts of the development process because it does require so much tuning. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Can you stress on the point of uh, the shuffle memory, how it is used and how we should be setting it? Like the memory overhead and the shuffle memory shuffle, right? Sure. Shuffle. Sure, so your JVM is gonna be um, broken up into a couple of different categories. I think by default, 25% of each JVM is gonna be reserved for overhead. Um, and then that, the rest of that is actually broken up into what is called M, um, this unified uh, region for storage and execute. And then within M, it's actually broken down further. Um, there's this subregion called R, which is reserved for storage of the RDD itself. And so there is a, there's a, this threshold minimum level of storage in the JVM reserved for the RDD. So I, I hope that starts to address your question. Those, those parameters are configurable. Um, what, what I find, um, if I need to know how much, how much of my JVM do I need to use for execute, what you could do is you could, um, oh, there's, a, there's a call to determine how much, um, how much memory you're using um, in your shuffle phase. I think it's size estimator, the size estimator method. And that's very helpful. Um, in addition to knowing how much storage your RDD is going to require. Over there. Yeah. So uh, in one of your slides, you said that you should avoid collecting data in the driver. So um, in, in our use case, what we do is we read data from different data sources, filter data, aggregate data, and then we have to collect that information. So instead of collecting, doing a collector's list in the driver, what would be an alternative solution that you would suggest? Sure. I, I definitely have to ask Rachel on this one. Yeah, so, so Do you want collect a mic? is, I think you is need a okay, mic. provided you're not collecting too much data. So for example, if you did one reduced statement and you know that you only have one remaining row of data, there's no problem with collect, right? So the trouble is just if it's an arbitrary quantity of data that's being collected to the driver, 
Um, one way that you can be really safe is to use take, which takes the first n number of rows. So that way you could say, I don't know, take 100 and you are hoping that your application has less than 100 rows, but if something has gone not according to plan, that might guarantee that you're not pulling in too much data to the driver. So we, we need to take the whole amount of data. I mean, if you need to do it, you need to do it, right? Um, but, but making sure that you're thinking really critically about how to make that data that you're collecting to the driver as small as possible. And if you're seeing out of memory errors in that step, then you might need to do something like write to HGFS or some um, distributed storage solution and then proceed with your, whatever your pipeline is. Okay, thank you. Over there. So I've been uh, doing some performance tests uh, using dynamic allocation versus explicit settings of driver memory and executor memory and max resource allocation. And almost always I'm finding that the explicit settings is the one that's giving me the most performance. Um, do you have any tips to share in terms of like what works best when you're looking at dynamic allocation? And also max resource allocation is not something I'm seeing a lot of performance out of the box. Almost always it only has a certain number of executors. So um, I'm kind of wondering what your, your experience has been given um, you know, these kind of situations. When you say max resource allocation, do you mean, which resource are you specifying there? Uh, it's basically resources for the memory, okay. uh, executor memory, as well as the, the, the default parallelism. Sure. Uh, it's basically resources for the memory, okay. uh, executor memory, as well as the, the, the default parallelism. Sure. I guess one thing I would m mention when you're calculating your max resources, um, uh, maybe I didn't, I didn't do it here, um, you saw the max memory specified was 8,000 megabytes, which is not a multiple of a gig. So definitely that would be one place to start. Um, but with the dynamic allocation, I mean, you're setting the minimums and the, the minimum number of executors, the, the start number of executors, and your max number of executors. So I guess I, I, I have a little bias when I see the comparison between dynamic allocation and um, explicitly setting the, the number of executors. I think, I totally believe you, but I don't have a tip for how to manage that because they're user input. Um, as far as the rest of the question, um, Oh, oh, the rest of the question was number of partitions. Um, let's see. It, we mentioned partitions earlier. I guess the, 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 the problem when you have too many partitions is that you're moving your data around unnecessarily. Um, the problem with too few partitions, I, I don't recall. The you're maybe not getting the full benefits of parallelism with too few. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, there is some iterative process there. And, and I think if I could just kind of tack on to that, it's like, the, the previous talk was about system ML, which is actually doing a lot of extra work to look at the size of your data. So we've definitely found that um, doing that process in an automatic way, saying, say with uh, the dynamic, these dynamic processes that come out of the box in Spark, is maybe not as good as if you know exactly what your data looks like and you can really be setting those partitions for every single wide transformation that you're doing with Spark it's very likely that you will see a better benefit with that because you're putting your hand much more closely on the dial. Mm -hmm. So in some ways that doesn't really surprise me all that much. And as far as number of partitions, maybe you want to speak about how to partition your data uh, using, you know, selecting a key to partition on? Maybe that would be helpful? Yeah, so one thing that we have really discovered again and again in the field is that not all data sets of the same size are equivalent. Um, so a lot of good um, performance in Spark hinges upon partitioning using something that will partition evenly and where you're not going to have too many values ending up on a single machine. Like for example, we ran into a lot of trouble doing things based on zip code because as you can imagine, zip code isn't an evenly distributed thing. Um, so making sure that you're choosing a key with a high number of distinct values so that one machine isn't going to blow up and that it's evenly distributed. It's like, we found led to humongous performance improvements. Have you ever um, tried 
taking a particular application and then creating a separate variable that was essentially a label and then use that to partition and then try to train for performance against that label. Essentially, Optum can actually write an optimization problem that was saying, given my app. That's such a cool idea. Um, not, not explicitly. We, we have done a little bit of sort of working creatively with, with what the keys are, often just to get them to have more distinct values. In general, Spark, I found that Spark handles, as long as you're not collecting things by key, Spark tends to do better with more. It might be fun with a simple yeah. to yeah. actually write an outer loop that yeah, tries that's to totally cool. actually create an um, unsupervised learning technique to discover what's fast. What's fast. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the idea, so everybody else can hear, the idea was to create another variable in your data that um, you can use to partition, um, right? I mean, at some level, I think a ran just a randomly generated number that follows like a normal distribution would probably work pretty well. well but it would be interesting to test that hypothesis. Yeah. Imagine it's app dependent. Yeah. So if there's any in embedded graphical structure to the information, you may actually recover a clustering yeah. that is much more efficient. Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. System yeah. LML is doing that under sense. the hood, I wonder. <laughs> All right, let's try one last question, and then we'll have people go up individually. Uh, yeah, so for the analytics you're writing, uh, are you using um, the lower level RDD, uh, getting close to there, or are you using data frames? And is there a big performance management piece in between those two? Um, so I'm mostly working with RDDs because I, and more comfortable with them. Um, there, I've found some instances where Spark SQL is really good, um, particularly with joins, because there's a lot of built-in functionality to Spark SQL to handle that use case really well. Um, in general, I've found that right now, Spark SQL is just so limited that most kinds of complicated Spark applications require you to go to the more generalized RDD format really early. Um, one thing that we are, or that I have done successfully a whole bunch though, is really mapping from wide to narrow data. Um, so, so I've found Spark works much better if you, instead of doing something on like lots of different columns, again, you're sort of mapping to more keys, each with smaller data. In general, I've found that to be a good sort of heuristic for op optimizing these kinds of applications. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Well, All we're right, happy great. to take more questions. Yeah, let's have one last round of applause for Anya and Rachel. And then Thank you.